Well, it all started in a log cabin. No. <laughs> hey, Dave. I'm honestly really excited to have you on the channel. It's really nice to have a professional video editor to you know, ask questions about how to edit and to you know, make our videos better. And so my first question for you is, if you were talking to somebody that told you, you know, I want to be a professional editor in the future, you know, I want to do this and get paid to do it like you do, what advice would you give them to help them make that happen? Well, I, I think they, uh, they need to spend a little time and do some research and they need to consider, you know, what type of hardware do they have available to them and what have they got to invest in their future for that type of business? And it, it, it's an important consideration because different software is going to have different requirements. I think one of the best uh, best packages out there for a person to get started with is actually DaVinci Resolve. Uh, they have a free version available and it's got everything built into one package. So you can do your editing, you can do your color correction, your special effects, your compositing. Uh, you can even do your sound processing and all that kind of stuff all, all in one package. And really there's very few limitations on the free version, especially since their latest update, they added a few more things available in the free version. Really the biggest limitation is you can't output in 4k. You can edit 4k. You just can't render out in 4k and when you get a feel for it and if, if you think you're really going to like it then you can buy the studio version and the studio version is cheap it's 295 bucks us and it's a one-time purchase and you get free lifetime updates so it's a great package and if you want to get into uh into it in a big way you might want to look at at picking up some hardware at the same time. They've got a they've got a program now where if you want to pick up this speed editor board, and this helps you uh, save a lot of time. And when you're doing this for a living, time is money. And if you buy that that keyboard for uh, $400, uh, you get the um, DaVinci Resolve Studio included for free. So basically you're paying an extra hundred bucks to get yourself a, a nice little piece of hardware. Well, that's really cool. I mean, I don't have one of those. I bet you that speeds things up. But you know me, I'm just there with my mouse and you know clicking the space bar every so often <laughs> to make cuts. Yeah. You know, and so you know slows my editing down. But I have to chip away at it anyway since you know, I have a full time job and kid and everything. So just a little here, a little there. Well, I mean that's that's the way it goes. We all got to start somewhere. And I was fortunate in that um, you know I've I've been in computers a long time. I I started with uh, learning computers in 1981. Started learning programs programming and kind of went from there. I've had a few computer businesses over the years. So with uh, with that experience, it allows me to uh, to learn new stuff very quickly. So I haven't actually been video editing for all that long. Um, I started video editing in about, I think the very first video I ever edited was probably May 2020. Okay. And I started off with the uh, with a, another free program that came with my uh, my Apple MacBook Pro, and that was iMovie. And I discovered it had some pretty serious limitations after about five or six videos, I was looking for something new. <laughs> so... I've always been a, a research hound, so I spent a few days and did some pretty serious research and stumbled across some reviews of DaVinci Resolve. So I gave it a try and and kind of the rest is history. Do you think there's anything that a person can do once they've found that software that can kind of speed up the process of learning to edit quicker, you know, so they could get to that point where they were a professional editor? Uh, yeah, there's a few things you can do. Um you know, the most important one is uh, is spending some time on YouTube. There's lots of really good channels out there that teach you how to do video editing. No, and not just necessarily DaVinci Resolve, but whatever package you've decided to use, you can find lots of tools out there for it, for learning. Uh, there's lots of free resources on YouTube channels. There's uh, Udemy.org. There's um, Skillshare. And there's a, there's a few others out there. You know, if you want to spend a few bucks, you can you can really get into the weeds. But um, I've pretty much found everything I I needed to learn uh, just by watching other free resources on YouTube. And then you need to start doing some projects. And just remember that your first few videos are going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> This, you know, don't be discouraged by it. It's it's just the reality of uh, of how it works. You know, you got to get used to being on camera. You've got to get used to the flow of talking on camera and putting your projects together and scripting stuff out and doing all your research. You're not going to learn it all at once. 
you know, it, it takes time. Probably my first, oh, my first 20 videos were terrible. You know, the information in them was good, but the production value was, was pretty horrid. <laughs> well, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> But we all go through it. And uh, so you, you just got to get your feet wet, hit record and and start working on stuff. And I was fortunate that I, uh, you know, I, I used to be a big resource for all of my friends and I got sick for a while and wasn't able to work. But when they heard I was back in action, I started getting phone calls, you know, help. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I had gotten so far behind, I couldn't actually do telephone tech support like I used to. I used to be able to just take people through it easily without even thinking about it. But, you know, I was 10, 12 years out of date by the time I was back in action. So what I had to do was start researching. And then I found I could just, my MacBook allowed me to easily make a, a desktop video showing them what to do once I'd researched it and figured it out myself. Yeah. <laughs> and and they liked it. It, it worked for them. And uh, they were asking for more. And I started doing a little more research and, and I was really enjoying the process. So I sp split off my own separate tutorial YouTube channel and, and I just went for it, started building the channel. And so I've been at it for, for, uh, oh, it's about a year and a half now, I guess. Okay. Uh, I started that channel June 1st, 2020. And on that channel, I've put out about 92 or 93 videos, somewhere in there. And then I I also, uh, I took on managing another YouTube channel for a friend of mine. And um, I probably started editing for him back in August of 2020. And I've probably edited about 150 videos for him and i've also d done a few custom projects that not they're not really uh videos for anybody in particular they're more kind of background tutorials for uh custom tools that i design for people like i make um custom effects that people can use in davinci resolve the packages that they can put in their effects library and drag onto videos and make changes easily to them. So I don't consider that part of my my YouTube tutorial channel. They're just kind of support videos for for products I sell, and uh, and some of them are available for free as well. And I do some uh, some graphics design work and brand identity stuff, logo design, that kind of thing. And I've worked for for people all over the world now. I've done work for people in England and. Iceland and Australia, South Africa, the States. Uh, I'm actually talking to somebody in New Zealand right now. So it's, oh, been, wow. uh, it's been pretty interesting. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've met a lot of people. Yeah, you meet a lot of really cool people through YouTube. And as far as the little things for editing that you make, like I still have that little um, like and subscribe thing that you designed for me or that you use. And I've used it in one or two of my videos. And it's so cool because I can just drag it in and boop, there it is, you know, reminding people to subscribe. And so, you know, it's yeah. kind of cool, very easy. And Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's pretty handy. I use it a lot. Actually, you know that uh, you can edit this part out if you want, but um, that uh, the problem that we had with the on the one that was transparent in the background that had the alpha channel. Yeah, I, I think you couldn't use that with it. Did it wasn't letting you put in the uh, the alpha channel, was it? No, I can't do that in Filmora. So I I mm. needed that other version that you made, and now I just use green screen or whatever, and it makes it the background go away, and it just looks awesome. Right. Okay. Super super simple, but well, if you ever do switch to something else, I figured out that problem of it of it blanking the audio track on it. Mm. So it was just a a setting I was missing when I was rendering it. So. Well, it's still oh. cool. I mean, I usually just remove the sound because that's my style. I don't really like the bing, but you know, yeah. some people love that. It depends on, on the way you make your videos, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's really a kind of a personal taste. Um, I, I started putting sound effects on all my stuff because that's what other YouTubers said you should do. So <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that too. I just personally haven't been able to get into music or um, or sound effects in my my videos. I feel like it it makes them weird, but maybe it's just me. I don't know. Yeah, it's. Uh... It, it can be a little challenging to find just the right sound for, for the effects that you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, I, I've always kind of been into doing the sound thing back in the day, like 20 years ago when I was doing professional web page design, uh, I had quite a few little things that I'd put on web pages where we would add sound effects that would go with it. So not really, uh, you know, no videos back then, of course, but we did some simple special effects that kind of thing. You know, I would have um, one of my favorites was I would have it would look like a piece of blank steel and then it would look like you stamp their logo into it and then I'd have the sound effect to go with it. Yeah. So 
I started working with doing sound processing and stuff probably back in the very early 2000s, 2002, okay. 2003. I was starting to play with with audio effects and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm just too lazy. That's my problem, I think. I, I, cause I'd, <laughs> I have to go you know, listen to all of them, try to find the right one. And I'm like, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know if that's a mistake, but you know, you were saying, you know, just like most of us, our first 20 videos are terrible. You know, what mistakes in editing have you seen either yourself make or that new YouTubers make all the time that just drive you nuts because now you're good at editing? Well, I think um, probably one of the one of the big things that a lot of people forget to do when they're doing their editing is when you you're recording sound soundtrack for something or an audio track you tend to do a lot of pausing and ums and ahs in normal speech just like i've been doing this whole time which you're probably going to edit out <laughs> <laughs> so you know forgetting to do that and i think the other big mistake and this is one i was really guilty of was overusing special effects and transitions and stuff like that <laughs> You know, I, when I, my first few videos, I was doing uh, transitions that were, you know, four and five seconds and all kinds of fancy stuff and using a different transition for every cut and that kind of thing. And it's, just, it's way too much. It's distracting and it, uh, it, it annoys people. And a lot of them will just click off your video. If, if you're using a lot of that, I found over time that less is more very quick, short effects except for very special circumstances. The longest trend transition I ever use is one that's two seconds and it only gets used generally once. And that's when you're doing a major change from one thing to another. So if you're completely changing subject matter and it's something completely different, I'll use, it's kind of like a, a stinger effect. So it'll, my, my logo will, a couple lines come in and my logo pops up and then it blacks, blanks out the screen with a colored background and and then when it all goes away, then you're on the new video. But that's that, that's something I use very sparingly. My other transitions, the one I use the most is called a smooth cut. It just, it lets it uh, morph from one to the other. And a lot of times you can use it to hide cuts that you've made. Like if you're doing a talking headpiece and you want to do a cut and you don't want it to look like your head's jumping around or, or that kind of thing between where you've done your cut. You can use a smooth cut and a lot of times you can't even tell there was a cut there. But when you use that same smooth cut for videos that are completely different from each other, one morphs into the other. It's a very slick looking effect. And the one I use, four frames long. That's it. Oh, okay. It's it's very subtle, but I use it heavily and people seem to really like it. And when you're doing um, text effects and stuff, a lot of times people get really carried away with all these fancy fly-ins and stuff like that. It's all well and good, but use that stuff sparingly if you're doing a lot of text coming up in different spots on a video i use a very simple animation i have the text uh, either drop from the top of the screen to the bottom or or the reverse of that and then i'll have it go back the way it came at the end very very subtle sound effect like a little little whoosh so it goes whooshes into place and whooshes back out and and uh, that little that little animation sequence is usually seven frames so very quick it just needs to be long enough that people can see that it's there, catches their attention, but not become the focus of the video. And I think that's, that's uh, those few things I think are probably the most important. And you have to get brutal about cutting out the fluff. Now me, I, you know, I don't have a lot of fluff to cut out on my stuff because, you know, I, I do technical tutorials. So there's not, you know, other than cutting out uh pauses and breathing and that kind of thing there's not a lot to cut out but when i do videos for clients uh i have to get pretty brutal of pulling out anything that doesn't forward the story and usually the clients are really happy with it it's been very rare that somebody said oh can you put this back in it, it's usually can you take more out <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah so you know when you're doing um when you're doing cuts on raw footage, sometimes you'll take two to three hours of footage and edit it down to five or 10 minutes. Isn't that crazy? But oh. it, it's so necessary. Yeah, it's, it's just bananas. It depends on the type of video you're doing. Uh, I was just actually watching uh, a video yesterday from a, a YouTuber that he does editing for the likes of Logan Paul and Mr. Beast. Uh, the videos that he's edited have seen over a billion hours of watch time altogether. So he, he knows what he's doing. And that, that's kind of his formula. 
he was he was saying himself you know typically for a logan paul video he'll edit for he'll take two hours of raw footage and the video will be less than five minutes when they're done it basically it's a highlight reel and but that's what for those types of videos that's what people want so you have to you have to gauge your audience you got to know who your viewers are and what they're looking for and edit accordingly you're obviously aware recently i did a music video for somebody down in Chile. And that was a completely different type of editing experience than all the other stuff that I do. So you have, you just have to know what your audience is and learn how to edit accordingly. And it just comes with practice. That's, that's the, that's the key practice, practice, practice. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Cause you know, when you first start on YouTube, you don't have all those skills and it's hard to make a video. And so if you're trying to put all these crazy transitions into a video and you, you're not cutting out the fluff, you're just, you'll spend all this time editing and only marginally improving your video, or maybe even hurting it, you know? And so it, it's a lot, it's a lot better to have a simpler form formula. And there's a lot of bigger creators that actually have a very simple formula. Like you'll watch their videos and there's not a ton of transitions and things. So you can make a video perform well without a ton of, you know, craziness in it Yeah, from, a, exactly. from an editing perspective, that is. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. You look at, uh, you look at all the, all the big channels out there and they use that kind of stuff very sparingly. So. Yeah. And there was this one larger YouTuber that I was watching her videos and her, she started putting this transition in her videos. And I was like, this kind of gives me a headache. And so I, you know, I just left a nice message, like, you know, love your video, but you might want to ditch that one transition. And, you know, I'm just casting my vote against it. And I noticed that it disappeared and I'm like, yeah, you know, it probably seemed fine to her, but it was literally like giving me a headache, you know? Yeah. And so, and so as a, you know, a (laughs) subscriber that cares, I was just like, Hey, just want to give you a heads up, you know? (laughs) And so, yeah, it's good to get feedback and, you know, you don't always know what your viewers will like, but they'll usually tell you, or you'll be able to tell in the analytics if something's not working. Well, and and a good creator should always be open to constructive criticism. It's how, it's how you improve. And it, when you first start at this, it can be really difficult to accept criticism on something that's become your baby. Yeah. And because, you know, it, it's easy to take it as a rejection of you rather than they're just trying to help you get better. So it, uh, it, it can be a difficult process. I know um, these guys that do channel reviews, I've heard so many comments from them. You know, they'll give somebody ad- advice on, on their channel and they'll check back, you know, a couple months later, or they'll ask for another review and they haven't done any of the big changes that they suggested they do. And, you know, they're not having any improvements and they wonder why. Yeah. So <laughs> you, ha- you have to be willing to take the advice to heart, especially if you're going seeking the advice. Oh, definitely. So, and I, I think that's just, it's part of the learning curve, learning how to, how to take that criticism and do something constructive with it. Well, let me ask you this. So I study a lot of different channels and I'm wondering how you personally define good video editing, because like, for example, one channel that I love film booth, his videos are super complex from a production standpoint. Like I would, I don't think I could make videos like that and ever get them out in a timely fashion, you know, but then there's other creators like Annie Dubé, for example, that her videos are fairly simple, you know, from like an editing perspective, like I think I could reproduce that type of editing very easily, but both videos perform just, you know, they're, they're, they're different. And so what is good editing? Well, I think good editing is, is something that allows you to get the point across that you're trying to make and do it in a timely fashion that works for your personality an editing style. And it's it's something that's going to develop over time. You can't just copy what everybody else is doing because, you know, that's something they've developed for themselves in the way that they work. So I think the, the key is to really kind of stick to the points that, sh- that you're trying to make in your video and dump everything else, get rid of it, go subtle on the effects and transitions and that kind of thing. And, you know, put your energy into the quality of the content itself all the fluff it, that's nice you can add it later as you get better at it and and you have a better feel for what works and what doesn't but when you're first starting out keep it simple stick to the point throw away everything else and you'll get there 
So something that goes along kind of with this, I think, is I'm actually in a unique position where I'm ready to move on from Filmora, the editing software that I use. I would consider it an intermediate level software, and I'm ready to start pushing myself towards something more advanced. Um, but you know, you'll hear YouTubers talking about different editing software, and it's kind of hard to to pick the right one. And you know, sometimes I think they just promote theirs because they can create an affiliate link, and it's just about making money. But but other times I'm like, hmm, well, there's some actual benefits to maybe that particular software. So if somebody's trying to pick, you know, which editing software they should get into, what would your advice be? Well, I think um, if you're looking to get into professional video editing, you have to accept that there's going to be some complexity involved. So there's going to be a learning curve. Um, So you're going to need to find some software that will allow you to do that complex work, but in as simple a way as possible. So you know, the kind of the industry standard out there right now still is Adobe Premiere with After Effects and all the other programs that they've got that goes with it. The problem, there's a couple of problems with that type of an approach is you've got all these different programs that you've got to deal with. Yes, they integrate together fairly well, but they're still separate programs that you have to, you know, shut down Premiere and go into this other program and use it. And then you've got subscriptions for all of this software and it can run into a lot of money pretty quickly. So really, if you can find something where everything's integrated into one package, DaVinci Resolve is great, but it's not the only one out there that does that. There's a few others. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but if you do some research out there, I'm sure you can find them. And they've got them at all different price points and you know, uh, and some of them have uh, f- free versions as well that are fairly powerful. Um, of course, I'm always going to be biased towards DaVinci Resolve because it's what I've got the most experience with. And, you know, it's it's a path I really embraced and it's got everything in one place. So I love it. And But that doesn't mean that's going to be the best one for you necessarily. I think it's worth a look. But uh, I think when you're first starting out, you don't want to be investing a lot of money until you are really comfortable with where you're going to go, what direction you're going to take. Same goes for hardware. I mean, when I first started, I was just, I was using an old 2016 MacBook Pro with 16 megs of RAM and old quad core uh, 2.9 gigahertz processor, you know, nothing, nothing fancy. And it still ran DaVinci Resolve and it ran it fairly decently, except when I got into doing fancier special effects, then it kind of brought it to its knees. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, once I started making some money doing this and then my, my MacBook had a problem, it, it blew its discrete graphics chip. So I had to, uh, I had to make a pivot. So fortunately I had some money coming my way from some video editing I was, I was doing and I had a a little stash of silver that I was able to cash in and, and I built a new PC. Luckily I'm, I'm a tech, so I've built hundreds of computers over the years. So building a new system for myself was was kind of a no brainer. And uh, so, it, you know, it's got some pretty serious specs, but I, you know, I, I knew what I needed uh, to run the software that I wanted to run and kind of future proof myself. So that's what I did. Unfortunately, right now with uh, graphics card shortages and chip shortages, building a new computer is a very expensive proposition. So I would recommend, unless you have a real clear picture of of where you're going and a fair chunk of change to to spend on it, uh, you know, start off a little more modest. You know, if you've got an existing laptop, find something that works on it and the rest will come later. Don't be in a panic. Uh, I think the biggest mistake a lot of new YouTubers make is going out and spending thousands and thousands of dollars on equipment, you know, fancy cameras and lighting and high-end microphones and all this stuff that it's not going to make your content any better. It'll make the production nicer, but it's not going to make the actual content any better. So I think it's uh, it's something that a, a person really needs to resolve to take things easy until you know the direction you're really going and find some people you can trust to get advice from. I think that's that's something else that's key. Uh, you know, even with all the knowledge I've got with uh, computer tech, you know, I, I still go to other people for advice. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the people I go go to for advice is an old instructor from when I went to back to school for computer, more computer training. He was an instructor there. He's, he's a good friend of mine. And I've known him for 30 plus years. And uh, he's been into computers obviously longer than I have. So, <laughs> he, you know, he's, he, he's somebody that I can, I can trust to go to and talk about stuff and learn to learn to do research 
and learn to trust in yourself. I think uh, a lot of, of uh, people looking to start a YouTube channel, they get caught up in analysis paralysis and never actually press record and get started. So I, I think sometimes it's better to just jump in with both feet and and learn as you go. Yeah, I, you know, one thing that I really liked that you said was, you know, they go out and they buy these expensive cameras and all this gear, and you really can make a decent video just on your smartphone if, if it can shoot, you know, 4K video. And I do that myself. And I remember when I first started, actually, I got a Canon M50, which is more expensive. And it, it I hated it. I had all kinds of problems because I didn't know how to use it. And so even though it objectively can make better video, it didn't really help me and it just made it so much harder. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's a very good observation. Um, you know, I found that I can make perfectly good video on my smartphone, and it does. It can do up to 4K 60. It's got good low light shooting capability. So I and I used to use it a lot more than I do now because now I've got with the new computer, I've got an actual cheap webcam, and it does a fairly decent job. It's what I'm using right now. Uh, but if I need to do something that's that's a little more high end or a little more creative. You know, I've got a tripod for my smartphone and I got a little Bluetooth remote control for my smartphone and, and it, it does an absolute fine job. And there's lots of people out there that create a ton of content on smartphones. It's a great place to start. And it's most people already have one. So let me ask you this though. So say somebody has just a phone and they've got their basic laptop to do video editing, you know, what is the order of operations that they should go through when they're, you know, creating a project and combining all their clips so that they actually get the video at the end that they were looking for? Well, I I think uh, you need to start with planning. And the one one little word that I want to add about equipment is the one thing that you should get is a cheap lavalier microphone at at the very least. Me personally, I I think audio quality is more important than video quality. Um, it's just something about human nature. If if you can hear it clearly and cleanly, nice crispy audio, uh, people are willing to forgive really lousy camera work. But your audio needs to be good. So uh, as far as when you're going to start doing videos, uh, I think the best order of operations. It's usually what I do is I uh, I come up with an, a couple ideas uh, of what I want to do, and then I go out and research. And I'll look at uh, our. I'll look at uh, what's my competition doing in that same genre. Has somebody else done a video of that exact same topic before? And if they have, what can I do to stand out from them? I don't want to copy what they've done. I'll take inspiration from them, but I'll come up with a new approach. And when I first started, I would actually sit down and I would script the entire thing. Uh, I even went as far as. Uh, making a homemade teleprompter it cost me nothing just out of spare junk I had laying around some cardboard. I, I took a piece of glass out of an old picture frame, took an old uh, vinyl binder, you know, with the cardboard covered with vinyl and you, you cut a hole in it and you stick your glass in there and you find some cloth to drape over it and you stick your camera behind it. I had a, or still have an old iPad kicking around. You can get uh, teleprompting software for that, that reverses the the text and turns it upside down so it'll reflect in the glass properly and you know just cheap stuff like that that'll get you going until you get more comfortable with with doing stuff on the fly now depending on what you do scripting might be something you should always do and other times you might want to just have point form on something that's within easy viewing you can look over at it read what you need to look back at the camera and edit that out later. And uh, if you're doing stuff like I do, I've got to a point now where I can just kind of flow with what I'm doing. I'll do a dry run usually before I actually film it for real so that I've got less editing to do after the fact. And uh, then you just proceed to do your, your editing in, in kind of the way we've discussed. So as far as how you're doing the editing within your, uh, within your editing package, uh, you should uh, bring your raw footage in and then go through and, and do a raw cut. Just find the spots in there that have basically what you need, get them onto your timeline, and then you'll need to go in and refine your cut and then maybe put in your, if you're putting an, an intro somewhere near the beginning and put your outro at the end. And then as you're going through and, and doing the refined edit, you can be putting in your, if you're doing any zooming into stuff, uh, if you're putting text on there, flashing text up, do that as you go. And once you've kind of got your more refined edit down, then you can go in and do any color correction if you're going to do that. 
I don't do color correction on my own stuff because I don't really need it, but I do color correction on my client videos uh, every time. So uh, it's it's there's a little bit of a learning curve to doing color correction. Although uh, when they came out with one of the major updates for DaVinci Resolve, they've got a really nice uh, auto balance feature that they added that works really well. It's a good starting point. So it saves you a lot of time. And I, I think other packages out there have their own versions of that in a lot of cases. Some work better than others. And once you've done your color correction, then you should go through and uh, set up your audio levels. If you're uploading stuff to YouTube, they've got some requirements. Uh, if you go over a certain level of audio, then they're going to compress your audio and then your video is going to sound like garbage. So you need to be aware of that and learn to work within that. For those of you who don't know, YouTube doesn't want you to go above uh, 14 LUFS. That's L-U-F-S. Don't ask me what it stands for. I don't have a clue. <laughs> but I know that I've got a uh, a setting in my... Uh, uh, in my Fairlight package in DaVinci that I can set to minus 14 LUFS and it'll tell me if I'm going to go over that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I uh, I do some compression on the on the audio and uh, some some limiting so that it brings it raises the low sound and it drops the high sound to give it a nice a nice mid level range and then you uh, you've got some other setting changes you can make that'll bring you up so that the loudest is just below that minus fourteen luffs you can go in and do some equalization if you need it um, I just edited a video today as a matter of fact it had a bunch of wind noise in the background so I had to go in and and do some noise reduction work and play with you some equalizer settings and stuff as well so you know learn to use those tools and then uh, and then you can do your render and that's that's kind of the basic steps uh, that I follow you know as as you uh, learn to use your program start trying to learn a new keyboard shortcut every week try and learn one new one until you get comfortable with it and then learn another new one the more of those shortcuts you learn or if you happen to pick up a, an editing board like I've got, you'll start getting faster and more efficient and you'll be able to put out more videos or you'll be able to do more complex videos in the same amount of time. And once you get to a certain point, people will probably start noticing your work if you're putting out a fair amount of stuff on YouTube. And then you'll start getting requests for doing work. That's how it started with me. Uh, actually, the first money I made doing video editing was when I started uh, managing another channel. He gives me a little piece of his monetization. So, and so I don't charge him individually for every video I edit. I, I just get a percentage of what he makes on his channel. So that's really cool. It works for me. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and it, you know, it, it was a good two way street because he had no ability really to do any video editing. He would just take stuff from his phone and upload it to his channel without doing any editing. And, uh, he had just monetized when I took over his channel and the first three videos I edited, he went from just over a thousand subscribers to 2,500 subscribers in just a few weeks. Wow. Just because he already, he already had good content. People liked it. But when we added that extra little something to it, some professional video editing, we had a, we had a couple of videos that just went nuts. And uh, so that's, he was, he was pretty happy to give me that little percentage of what he makes on it. So, and, and that's, that's awesome. Cause like it motivates you to continue to edit his videos even better and, you know, and, and it'll make them perform better. And so it's like, it just, you know, the more he makes, the more you make and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I've actually, uh, uh, I've had some good tutorials come out of stuff that I've built for him. Uh, like I know the, uh, the first intro that I built him, I mean, it was okay, but it was the cheese factor was pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest. Yeah, but I mean, it, it worked and it was better than no intro at all. So, um, but I built him one, uh, well, I guess a couple, three months ago now that I uh, I wound up turning into a tutorial because it turned out really well. And uh, he's really happy with it. And I've gotten a lot of good comments on it. And I've used other stuff of his uh, as fodder for my tutorials as well. <laughs> so well, not just my own stuff. Might as well. I mean, every experience you have, it, it gives you something to talk about. And actually, I guess that's kind of my next question is like, what experiences have you had where you, you know, maybe made a mistake and it ruined a project or, you know, something crazy happened with a client, you know, anything like that? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I've got a couple things that have happened. Um, 
I was uh, I was doing a tutorial video on on uh, how to build a computer. Uh, it was actually a computer that I built for this guy that I took over his channel. He needed a new computer and he decided at some point he wants to learn video editing. So he asked for some consultation for, for parts and then he asked me to build it for him. So I said, well, okay, perfect. I'll turn that into a tutorial. And I sat down one day and I, I did about two hours worth of work and realized I forgot to press record. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So I had to take everything apart. I had to put all the parts back in the boxes so I could do the unboxing again. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, I tell you, I never made that mistake again. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I, I've had times where I've had to re-record stuff because I, I did something wrong with the audio settings and the audio track came out all all clipped and there's nothing you can do with that if if it's clipping because it's coming through too loud you can't you can't save that so and and i i've had the odd one where it was just a touch too loud and just the odd points were clipping and it wasn't really a very important video so uh, i said to heck with it and let it go and uh, and i've had other times where i've tried to do a tutorial and uh well i'll give you a good example i had a tutorial i did about a year ago maybe a little more on how to transfer something directly from your google drive to your youtube channel without having to download it and then upload it so uh there's a they've got a tool for that that's hosted by google and it was very popular um people really liked it it's one of my more popular videos and then i i started getting messages hey this doesn't work for me uh can you help me out with this so i was figured well they must have changed some stuff i'll go redo the video do a new version it doesn't work anymore the program's still there you can go through the motions but it gives you an error every time you try it and i mean i've tried everything i can't figure it out so stuff like that's going to happen uh not necessarily you know if you're not doing tutorials obviously that type of thing is going to happen but there's going to be projects that you're going to try that just aren't going to work and you got to be willing to let it go and maybe come back to it later a couple months down the road when you've got more information or something like that but uh you have to be willing to let stuff go when it's not working and try something else that's really too bad about that feature that would be really convenient and and i'm sure it's hard to decide what to do with that video now you know it's like do i leave it up do i take it down you know you know it's just really too bad i hate i hate it when that kind of thing happens because like i bought this um software that you could use for writing it was this really cool program and i bought a lifetime version of it and then the guy who made it has just ba basically abandoned his website and so so when I went to go re-download it, I couldn't because the file was corrupted or something. It just doesn't work anymore. And you can't contact him. And I'm just like, oh, no. You know? Yeah, I know. I, I had something that happened recently similar to that. There's a program that I use, and I still use this program. Luckily, it still works. But um, it's a program I use on my MacBook for, for graphics work. It's very powerful, but it's a lot simpler than something like Inkscape or Illustrator. It doesn't have a lot of the extras, but for a lot of the stuff I do, it's it's far faster. So I, I still use it all the time. And I got to know that program extremely well. There's there's almost nothing it can do that I don't know how to do with it. So I actually started creating a masterclass series on it. And as I got into it and started doing more research, I discovered that they haven't updated it in over three years, actually be close to four years now. And it doesn't look like they're ever going to. You can't get a hold of them for any tech support or ask them any questions, anything like that. It's still available for sale on the App Store, but um, you can't... Uh, you can't get in touch with them. The website's still up the last time I looked. And people that use the program like my videos on it, but I wound up not finishing the series. I had it was all set up to go on Udemy. I had the first three episodes all done. And then I was about the time my MacBook blew up. <laughs> so uh, I wound up uh, wiping my system and redoing it. So now I can use the program again. But um it's now there's a couple of things in it that are buggy because of my hardware. So I can't, I can't finish that series and there wouldn't be much point in spending the time to finish it. So stuff like that's going to happen in, in this game. It's really too bad, but yeah, I guess with technology, everything's changing and you know, it's, you just kind of have to probably let some stuff go. Yeah. Well, I know I, I was trying to learn how to use Inkscape uh, on my MacBook and MacBook, my old poor MacBook, it just wasn't enough hardware there to really use it. It was really laggy and sluggish. And <laughs> <laughs> but I use it all the time on uh, on my uh, Windows PC. But uh, it was really annoying getting to learn that program because it has a far different way of doing stuff than what I was used to. <laughs> 
Let me tell you, there was a lot of um, tearing my hair out in frustration. Uh, the first, probably the first 20 thumbnails I built with that, with that new program. I was just, oh, it was driving me nuts. <laughs> That's too bad. But yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting better with it now, but there's still so much I don't know how to do in it that I want to start doing tutorials in it, but I got a lot more to learn before I can even think of it. So, <laughs> yeah. And that's gotta be hard for your channel. Cause you've got to learn something and then figure out the best way to explain it to others, you know, in a great video. So, yeah. And that's, it's actually good in a lot of ways because when I do the research to learn how to do something well enough to teach others, I learn a whole lot myself. So, uh, you know, some of the stuff I do tutorials on, they're, they're kind of lazy because I, I know it inside and out, so I don't have to really think about it. But I find the ones where I have to really challenge myself to learn something new before I can do the video, I actually enjoy those the most. I think it's kind of human nature when you when you challenge yourself. It, the uh, when you challenge yourself and get good results, it's very satisfying. Oh, definitely. You know, I try to learn something new every day at work because I work in IT as well, and so it's you know if you aren't learning something new, you're falling behind. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, another thing that you're going to need to pick up, if you're going to be a professional video editor working for other people, uh, you really have to learn how to handle clients. And that that can be a challenge for a lot of people. It's it's different when you're working for yourself than than when you're dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. And I did it for a lot of years. You know, you've probably done it yourself doing IT work, but I had my own businesses working for multiple clients and between the IT work and custom programming and web page design and all the graphics work I've done for people over the years, you really have to learn how to to deal with clients and and not be insulted when somebody critiques your work and don't like what you did. Yeah. And that that is a learned skill. It it really is, at least for me it was. I had to really work at it. There was a lot of a lot of times dealing with clients where I had to really bite my tongue and go and cool down after the meeting and that kind of thing. And you know, one of our partners that we had, he wasn't so good at biting his tongue dealing with clients. And we lost a couple of clients because he spoke his mind a little too um, directly. <laughs> Oh no. Uh, yeah. Getting angry with a client and shouting at them is not a good way to do business. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, he's a really nice guy uh, under most circumstances and he, he's a, a good tech and knew what he was doing, but you know, dealing with clients is also part of the picture if you're going to grow your business. So, and there are actually lots of really good places on YouTube that teach you how to deal with clients and how to stay calm in stressful situations and that kind of thing. It's something that can be learned. So do you have any other specific stories of experiences with clients that, you know, people watching this might find valuable, maybe so they don't say the wrong thing or just to entertain us? Well, I think uh, probably the types of clients that can give you the most trouble is when you're dealing with creative stuff because it's, it's very subjective. And I know uh, probably the biggest problems I've had is in logo design of all things. Um, but you know, I've I've done logos for people where they've got a you know they come to me with a very specific idea of what they want, and you know from the beginning it's probably not going to work very well. And you try to explain that to them gently, but they want what they want, so you have to produce it for them and then they look at it and then you get the call no, i don't like this <laughs> uh i think the last logo design i did for somebody we did 12 different designs before he was finally happy with it oh my gosh that that's a lot and you know it a lot of times it's those smaller jobs that you're doing for for less money that give you the most problems. If you're dealing with a big client where you're doing a complete brand identity redesign, you know, they're willing to go through the front part of the process where you you refine stuff down uh, before you ever start doing actual logo design. You know, there's a whole set of processes you go through to, to uh, find out the types of stuff that they like, the type of direction they're looking for, what they're trying to accomplish with their brand identity, or, you know, are they trying to break into a new market? Uh, you, you do uh, research on the types of clients they're going to have and what those clients like. So you have all that information going in before you actually start designing. And then it's actually a much simpler process. It's longer and more complex, but certainly a lot less frustrating. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> 
So, and it's not like I got a great deal of experience doing full brand identity design. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to pass myself off as a big expert. If I was, I'd be making a lot more money than I am now. <laughs> well, design is a whole separate set of skills. It's not the same as editing necessarily, you know, because you could, you could do thumbnails and just specialize in that, you know? Yeah. There, there's people that actually make a good dollar on Fiverr doing just thumbnails for people. And you no, know, I've, I've done some work for people on Fiverr and those are actually the most often the most problematic clients. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that one I was talking about where I had to redesign it 12 times, that was a fiber client. But it's not like that was the first time I've had to do a bunch of redesigns on projects long before Fiverr was ever even a thing. But uh, yeah, I think that happens a lot on places like Fiverr, especially when you're first trying to break into doing freelance work like that because you're doing it cheaper. And when you got people that are looking to get a whole lot of something for not very much, they, they tend to be fussier. And I don't know why that is, but it just seems to be the way it works. But uh, I think it's good training for when you start getting the bigger clients, you, you, you start to get a feel on how to deal with people. And when you're dealing with a bigger client and there's a lot of money involved, then that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. We all have to start somewhere. It's just the way it works. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I want to ask you is, I know we've heard a little bit already, but kind of where did you start and what is the story of your channel? Well, um, well, it all started in a log cabin. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I should I should probably preface a little bit of what got me into computers as, as a career path. It, it, it does kind of start there. When I was 15, uh, my mom and I went down to my sister's wedding in the lower mainland in BC and uh, Canada, of course. And, you know, I mean, I was 15. They were busy prepping for a wedding and I was just underfoot and, and uh, they didn't want to deal with me. So my sister took me downstairs and sat me in front of their what at the time was a very expensive computer system, showed me how to load up the uh, the GW basic programming language, how to load up a program, how to run it, how to look at the code and said, have fun, learn. And I had never touched a computer before in my life. And I guess about four hours later, they came looking for me because I was nowhere to be found. And just as my sister walked in, I was running a program and I had, uh, I had this uh, planet show up and a ring would show up around it and tilt over and start spinning and then another ring and another ring oh and she's like where did you find that program i don't remember seeing that oh i made it well how did you do that well, i started looking at what did what in the code and figuring stuff out and experimenting so she looked at me and said well i guess we know what your future is going to be <laughs> and you know that's that's kind of the way it went a couple years later i got my first computer of my own and started really learning in earnest and by the time well by the time i went back to school to learn computers i had already owned several and so in in 1991 i went back to school for computer programming and systems analysis and i did pretty well in there um, graduated with honors. And one of my instructors that I became good friends with later, he got me into really learning how to deal with the hardware side of it because he was a hardware guy. So a couple of years later, I built my first computer from parts. Year after that, I started my first computer business doing tech work and programming. And it just kind of went from there. So I kind of became the tech guy for everybody that I knew. And then I got, uh, got into a few different businesses. We had a few things going at once. And uh, when I got sick, I had to sell off my shares and shut down the other smaller businesses. Couldn't work anymore. And then when I got uh, kind of got back and got a little health again and started being able to work, relearn what I'd gotten behind on. And that's when friends started calling me to fix stuff for them again. And I couldn't take them through it over the phone anymore. So I had to research it and figure it out. And then I made a video sent it and put the video up on my personal YouTube channel and sent them a link and it worked for them. And they liked it and I really enjoyed it. Wound up starting my own channel and it just kind of went from there. That's what got me started in it. Wasn't well, it funny that once people know you have a skill, all of a sudden they're like, hey, you want to help me with this? <laughs> And, and really, your YouTube channel, you're just doing more of what you already do, which is helping people solve problems. And so 
you know, that's why people should go and subscribe is just because, you know, it, they can watch these tutorials and know how to do things and fix the issues that they have and, and learn new stuff. Like one of your most recent ones, I, I didn't know something about two factor authentication that, you know, you mentioned in the video and I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't watched the video. And so, you know, well, I, I think, um, I, I work with a little different philosophy than a lot of the tech YouTubers out there. Many of them try to keep their, their videos to 10 to 20 minutes long and they go through stuff very quickly. And I know when I was trying to get caught up on years of technology that I, that I had lost track of, I, I was very frustrated by the fact that I had to go to, you know, 20 different channels and several videos on each channel to gather all the information I needed to really learn a subject from the beginning and, and master it. It took a lot of time and, and all the, all this running around all over the place and pausing and rewinding and pausing and rewinding it. You know, I, so I, I decided when I was going to start doing my videos, I would take people through in a slower methodical fashion and cover every aspect of it I could. So I could take them from beginner to a master in one, two, or three videos. So my videos tend to be quite a bit longer. I've got a few shorter ones. They're 10, 15 minutes. Where I just show a few simple things, some tips and tricks. But most of my videos are about an hour long and they really take you through the fine detail. We really go go into the weeds. And uh, like one of the videos I that I just finished is actually the uh, part two of the video you were just talking about. Uh, it actually just went up today. And that puppy's an hour long, but it takes you... Th- and I still have a third part to do, but it takes you through every aspect of of setting up and customizing a new YouTube channel. We go through every single thing, what it does, why it does it, at least to the best of my knowledge. And so it's a pretty it's a pretty thorough covering of the subject matter. And uh, I think there's a place for that out there. There's also a place for those for those quick ones that only take you through a few things. But it's what I decided to do to set myself apart from most of the other channels out there. Well, there's definitely a place for this because I've actually had several instances where people have reached out to me directly through Facebook. Like they'll just message me and they'll be like, I don't know how to start a YouTube channel. I don't know how to make a video. And they like, they literally want to know, you know, how to create the channel, you know, like you do in this tutorial you're talking about. And it's like now that I know you and I know your stuff's good, I can easily just be like, hey, this is the process. And then I don't have to bother making a video on something that isn't in a isn't as interesting to me. Like I usually just like to talk about YouTube more generally. And it's like I can just direct them to this very step-by-step type of video that will walk them through it. And I think some people will really appreciate that style of a video because you know, if if you skip steps, they're like, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, and that that's exactly right. That was the challenge that I had when I was trying to relearn all this stuff. So that's uh that's why I chose to do them the way I do. And, you know, my channel grows a little slower because of it, but I also had some other things that I was doing wrong that I've been recently addressing and it's already making some, some changes. So, uh, I think, uh, I, I think as you go on, you start to develop a, a momentum and it starts to give you that snowball effect as things grow, it grows a little faster. And as you grow a little faster and get bigger then it, it continues to speed up. So, uh, Something that a lot of people get hung up on is they hear these stories about somebody who started the channel and got a a thousand subscribers in three months. Well, that is the very rare exception to the rule. It just, it normally does not happen that fast. The average channel out there, according to the research I've done and a few people that I know that have monetized, it takes a minimum of about 150 videos before people can monetize on average. There's always going to be an exception to that rule, but 99% of the time, by the time you get 150 videos, you're probably going to be getting pretty close to monetizing. Well, by then you figured out your style. And one thing that I think is great is, um, you know, because you're so focused on the viewer and how, you know, you can make videos so that it'll help them, you know, you're probably going to get there a lot faster versus if you were just making videos the way that you wanted to, or just to make money or whatever, you know, you're actually focusing on the viewer. And with that in mind, we probably should wrap this live up because it's getting a little <laughs> long. <laughs> but it, it's been literally awesome talking to you. And, you know, I really appreciate having you on the channel. So, oh, I'm uh, absolutely tickled that you wanted to have me on. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, contribute to the community.